Peter, you are about to publish the study about the um, Russian propaganda and informational warfare. So what is uh, new on that? What is special about that? So, I mean, uh, the study is called uh, the Kremlin's weaponization of information, uh, culture and money. Um, and uh, what the Kremlin's done is sort of redefined the rules of propaganda and, uh, and influence abroad. And uh, it's really worked out the weaknesses of the Western system and its plays on them. So, I mean, there's three elements, I think, that, that the Kremlin focuses on. Um, I mean, we all think that information uh, is a neutral thing in many ways, that it's a good thing, that freedom of information is sort of a sacred thing in Western society. Um, it's the First Amendment in America. Um, what the Kremlin has done is, is taken information and instead of using it as a way to persuade or engage in debate or all the kind of things that we associate information with, it really thinks about it in military terms. So uh, it thinks of information as a way to sabotage, demoralize, blackmail, confuse, um, break down communication in Western society. So it uses a tool like Russia Today as a weapon, not as a way to convince somebody else. Uh, something similar happens with culture. So we think of cultural exchange as a priori a good thing. So if you know, the Russian Orthodox Church has a role to play in Eastern Europe, we think that's great. All churches should talk to each other and have a, uh, a fruitful dialogue. Or, or when Russian NGOs appear in Central Asia, we think that's great. It's good to, to, for cultures to talk to each other. But since around 2004, Russia has been thinking about how one uses cultural institutions like the church or, or cultural NGOs as ways to sort of sow chaos and subvert other societies. Uh, a lot of time this is rationalized by saying this is what the West does to us. Look at all these Western geos, they're plotting revolution in Russia. Um, and Russia, almost because it's so paranoid, then becomes ahead of the game in being aggressive because then it really does use its cultural NGOs that way. But a lot of people would tell that everybody has their own propaganda. The US have, the, I mean, some um, European countries who have, I mean, a lot of people all over the world have. What is so special? Well, look, there's two things I think to think about. Uh, the first one is, look, a lot of these techniques that the Kremlin uses, we certainly see them in the West. You know, we've seen them for decades in the West. So we need only to think about the uh, American operation in Guatemala in the, in, in the early 1950s, when America basically, uh, you know, uh, essentially invented a, a communist threat in order to uh, cause a coup in Guatemala. But the, the difference is that, sure, the West uses a lot of these techniques, uh, but they're part of a very large armory of, 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 of tools. Um, the Kremlin, because it feels itself so much weaker, um, has kind of concentrated all the covert and dirty techniques, funded them massively, and turned it into the main policy they have. So if one can almost imagine all the worst bits of covert Western influence, and imagine they were just brought together to create one super weapon. That's essentially what the Russians have done. Um, so yeah, we can recognize these techniques everywhere. So that's the first issue. The second issue, I think we have a problem with this word propaganda. Everything is propaganda as one of the Kremlin's kind of ideological weapons. I think we really have to sit down and think about the challenges for the 21st century. Because if in the 20th century, the main challenge was the battle for freedom of information, the battle against censorship, now the main battle is going to be uh, the problem of the abuse of freedom of information. So yes, we've always had um, propaganda, but now contemporary media make these tools much more vicious and much more powerful. And we really have no way of conceptualizing the threats. In a way, you can't forbid the media, it doesn't matter what they're doing. And this is the way, I mean, the totalitarian states used to do, making like um, not allowed to publish the articles or like trying to squeeze them. Yeah, so what, what the way sure, to deal with that? No, no, I certainly wouldn't advocate um, a, any kind of censorship um, unless it's maybe a critical military situation like you have in Ukraine, where I think there was a, a, a strong argument to switch off some of the Kremlin channels. But generally, no, I think that's completely unnecessary. And that almost plays into the Kremlin's game because it's trying to, you know, it's trying to cause conflict here. No, 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 I think, I think we need, it's a case of um, finding the right analytical tools and the right, and then the right instruments with, with, 
with which to self-regulate media. So, for example, it's really, I mean, it's not that complicated. Um, I think one has to develop, I think the main TV channels like Al Jazeera, the BBC, etc., etc., they need to sit down and almost develop a charter of sort of uh, behavior which they say defines them as media and behavior which doesn't. So it's quite, it's fine having differences of opinion. It's not fine to use an information channel for disinformation, which is what Russia Today does. It just lies and it thinks it's fine to lie. So they would almost develop sort of uh, common rules and common practices and just through peer group pressure then say, look, we're media, we all subscribe to this charter, whatever these guys are, they're not part of our gang. You know, you can watch them if you like, but you know, they're not part of what we recognize as media. And Russia today would still have its sort of um, audience of, of, of uh, paranoid schizophrenics, but it wouldn't, uh, the sense would no longer listen to it. Um, also, I think we need sort of NGOs, a bit like Transparency International, uh, or sort of um, investigate corruption and become like a marker for corruption. Or human rights NGOs look at human rights issues internationally. We need NGOs which are internationally recognized, uh, which would follow disinformation and would say, like, this channel, uh, this channel, they've gone beyond the pale. They get a one out of ten. And people would just stop sort of uh, looking at these channels as legitimate sources. I think we need to talk about Russia today. What's your criticism? I mean, when I would speak to the people from Russia today, they would say, like, yeah, we do have some agenda, but it's still journalism. Why you would prove? What is the difference? Sure. So, listen, there's absolutely nothing wrong. I mean, officially, Russia Today's position is to give a Russian point of view. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's called public diplomacy. The America, America has Voice of America, which does this. Ukraine doesn't have anything at the moment, which is a big loss. It should have something. I'm actually for more public diplomacy. Uh, but that's not what they actually do. They actually say nothing about Russia. They hardly sell Russia at all. They use, um, they, Russia Today is used for what used to be called in the Cold War active measures. Uh, it's a way of spreading disinformation and lies dressed up as journalism. I mean, well, everybody remembers what role played Fox News in the U.S. during the Iraqi war? Uh, not just during the Iraqi war, Fox News... I mean, uh, and in a lot of other cases. Yeah, so, but Fox News generally, and I think some of its behavior is beyond the pale, so this is why exactly you need some sort of self-regulation of this activity, but Fox News basically is sort of classic agitational propaganda. You know, they have a cause and they support it, you know. They believe that sort of republicanism is great, you know, Obama is evil and they try to prove it. Uh, some of the techniques they use, I think, are beyond the pale. The use of conspiracy theories to undermine, I think, is something that is beyond any kind of behavior. However, Rush Day aren't trying to convince anybody of anything. They're not in the business of persuading. They're in the business of uh, sowing confusion, um, uh, sowing divisions, they're in the business of sabotage, blackmail. These are completely different mechanisms. They have nothing to do with any kind of journalistic uh, discourse. So we need to start defining what these forms of behavior are. When you talk that Russia used information as a weapon, what is your example? You know, like we can generally talk it, but can you explain? Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, a, a very simple example is the MH17 crash when Russia Today, and Russia Today is not just the TV channel now, you know, it's a huge conglomerate, you know, it's, it's news, it's social media, it's internet. After the MH17 crash, the, the mission they had was to throw a million conspiracy theories out there to kind of, you know, to fog up and confuse the space. This was done completely consciously, so you know, they started spitting out one conspiracy theory after the next. There wasn't, this wasn't an honest journalistic discussion about the possible causes of the crash. This is a way of sowing confusion and, you know, distracting from, from other issues. So, so there, for example, uh, some of their coverage uh, in Syria was, was very insidious. So they invented a massacre which didn't exist. Uh, they invented uses of chemical weapons, which didn't exist. There were quite a lot of pl times when they were just using disinformation. There was absolutely no way they didn't know this. And but uh, what is special about their Ukrainian coverage, besides the their Ukrainian the coverage? Um, so there have been some classic ones. So there was a, um, an incredible uh, uh, series of reports about um, threats to the Jewish community. Um, in Ukraine, because one of the biggest, you know, lines has been to try to convince the world that um, fascists have taken power in Ukraine, and there were interviews with sort of representatives of the Jewish community where they completely twisted their words and reversed the meaning. This was done on purpose. I think, you know, 
you'd immediately say this is the sort of behavior which is not part of journalism. You're not trying to persuade, convince, or anything. This is, this is a secret service you know, operation. Um, so so, so that, that was a very kind of um, noticeable moment. There were several programs that they made which used um, something that uh, linguists call false assurances, so false comparisons. So for example, there was a program comparing uh, the actions of the Ukrainian government to the genocide in Rwanda. You know, this is completely sort of false logic that was being used. So I, any way of regulating the field would have to look at these kind of models of speech, models of discourse. Sometimes the Ukrainian government tries to spin the stories. Sometimes they give in the wrong information about what's happening on the ground. They're not talking a lot about the civilians, which might be killed by the Ukrainian troops. Um, and probably there are um, some ultranationalists who are in, par in the parliament and probably would run for the parliament. Well, governments lie all the time. We're not talking about governments. We're talking. We're talking about. Uh, uh, we're talking about something which says it's a media that deals in information. So governments, I assume, lie all the time. I think that's just a sine qua non of, of journalism. Um, uh, so listen, yes, uh, any any kind of media should should be sensitive uh, to those sort of things. But listen, something could say that it's public diplomacy, that it's it's not really a journalistic uh, body, that its its mission is to explain government policy publicly. Um, that's kind of what Voice of America will increasingly might start to do in America. It's changed its charter a little bit. So, but there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you're doing this, you're not, uh, you're not lying. Your role is to explain government policy. That's what you say what you are, and that's fine. Um, then you should be sort of defined as a public diplomacy channel. That's fine. I mean, this is a legitimate form of communication. Um, you should just say what it is. But why the West should care? So, it's a very good question, because this really gets into the question of what is the you know, what is the relevance of Russia? I, my sense is that we need to stop thinking about Russia as kind of a, a freakish problem, because then we always get into this debate about a new Cold War, not a new Cold War. I don't think that categorizes Russia in, in the right way. What, what, what the present Russian government has done is worked out the weak spots of globalization. Uh, we haven't talked about money enough. They also use money in a very clever way. So when it's almost like an x-ray of the weaknesses in the Western system. So we actually have to start thinking about Russia as a sort of a, an avant-garde of malevolent globalization. Uh, and then it becomes very clear that the issues Russia raises uh, are kind of relevant to our own system. It's about healing our own system rather than thinking about the importance of Russia. And we also have to understand that what Russia is doing now in terms of its sort of misuse of information, misuse of culture, misuse of money, is going to be taken up and is being taken up by other aggressive rising authoritarian states. This is going to be, these are the challenges, the global challenges for the 21st century. They're not Russia specific issues. So we have to start developing these institutions and the mental ideas with which to deal with it. Because at the moment we just don't have any. Um, so that's very much my sense. I mean, Russia is giving a sort of perverted globalization and we have to, we have to start getting on top of it. Okay, but why then you the world should care about Ukraine in a way. Okay, there is something new there. There is a global challenge. But here you have, actually, yeah, for us, it's a big country. It's our country. But in a way, the troubles all over the world. Um, well, the reason I find Ukraine exciting uh, is because um, it's a country that is going through um, a search for a new form of politics, a new form of government before our very eyes. I mean, politics in the West is sort of finished in the sense that there's a, there's a sort of politics ha seems to happen on autopilot in the West. The only, um, the only bits, the only political movements with any sort of energy at the moment are, are largely far right movements, very sadly. Uh, Ukraine right now is full of a whole generation of people looking for new political models, looking for utopias. Um, and that's incredibly invigorating and refreshing. So I think Ukraine matters almost like this, the place where sort of, sort of few, the future of politics is being experimented with and defined and seen whether it's possible. It's, it's, it's the place at the moment where we're seeing whether democracy can still work in the 21st century. Uh, but um, there would be those here who are very concerned that, you know, you have the uh, battalion commanders coming to the parliament just because they're very popular on Facebook. 
Yes, exactly. So let's look at it. Let's start looking at uh, what's going on in Ukraine. It's, it's, it's the crucible of experimentation for the 21st century. Um, that's why it's so exciting. It's dangerous. It's scary. Um, that's what makes it interesting. I think it can be something of uh, old time populism, just in a new social media way. There's plenty of that. There's, there's something, uh, there's liquid Democrats here. There's new nationalists, old nationalists, romantic nationalists. There's Euro dreamers, anarchists, socialists. There is a, an incredible sense that politics can be created. And there's a very high risk it'll fail because, you know, the corruption might eat up all this idealism very quickly. But that, that is what makes it exciting and vivid. Um, and uh, um, it's sort of the focus of what the future might be. Um, it's, 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 it's the place where we're seeing how the future could form. I think there are a lot of institutions now writing, discussing Russia and Ukraine, and in a way it doesn't lead to something. Within the, There is a feeling here in Ukraine that it, you know, like there is no any, anything going on in fact. But what do you think it's actually, I mean, re being realistic? What Ukraine really can expect from the West? Uh, what is unrealistic? And um, to you know, like, to what understanding? To to which extent there is like general understanding of the situation here? There is absolutely no understanding of the situation here. Why? Pub in public, in in the public space. Um, well, I exaggerate. Um, you know, even more even more important than the lack of understanding, because people who want to understand do understand. Is, is a lack of caring, really. People do care about an aggressive new Russia. They don't, at the moment, care about Ukraine because they have no emotional connection to it. They have no image in their head. They have no, un, no kind of instinctive connection to it. Um, so really the challenge um, for Ukraine and for you is to, uh, is to start to build that sort of emotional bridge. Um, that's the first thing. Um, uh, the second thing, what was the second thing? What's the other thing you want to know? I'm talking about like what... Um, what to expect? You mean from yeah, governments? Yeah, yeah. From governments? Yeah. Um, a, a lot of words and no action, uh, essentially. Um, listen, I mean, what we're speaking today, the two most hawkish and proactive ambassadors, uh, foreign ministers, the two most proactive European foreign ministers are leaving or have left their, uh, their posts. Um, the EU has signaled that it's going to be very soft on Russia by nominating uh, a foreign policy chief who, whose instincts seem to be to be, you know, for detente with Moscow. And any sort of detente with Moscow will, will kind of necessarily mean softening support for Ukraine. So there'll be a lot of words, very little action and a lot of praying. I think, I think despite the language, the 450 billion of trade with Russia is such a, a big, immovable fact that that will actually guide most policymaking. So um, you're kind of on your own.